Hello and welcome to China Talk. I'm your host, Jordan Schneider. Today's guest is Tanner Greer of Scholar Stage and the blogger I want to be. We get into China's strategic tradition, hawks and doves on China's intentions abroad, Xi's theory of history, how a war in Taiwan would play out, how the CCP's toolkit stays the same over time, and the tragedy of the Chinese tradition. Tanner, thanks so much for coming on China Talk. Thanks for having me. How would you rate the level of understanding that the U.S. has towards China today compared to how much the U.S. got the Soviet Union during the Cold War era? That's a good question. I think, in some ways, we understand China currently in ways that the Americans of, say, the '70s or the '60s could not understand the Soviet Union. Right? The access we have is incredible and so different than then, and that's especially true、sure. if you're studying something like technology or I don't know how. Migrant workers do stuff, and in those respects, you're in a much better world.、Uh, in another respect, though, I, I almost feel like increased access to China has hindered our ability to understand maybe strategic intentions at the top level, right? What the party wants to do and what they kind of encode in things like their political work reports. And I would maybe give three reasons for this: three reasons why our increased access can sometimes cloud. Our understanding instead of enlighten it. The first、uh, is what I call like my friend from Beida problem, which is that all these people go to China now and have these formative experiences, studying in Shanghai or Beijing or whatever, and you know they make that friend of theirs. Like they they have this new friend they make who goes to Beida and is this really smart college student liberal who doesn't take Marxism seriously at all and kind of laughs at the party and maybe is very political. But is not at all representative of the standard Chinese view, much less the view at the top level of of the party. And it's really easy for somebody who comes to China to hang out with these people, because these are the people who want to hang out with Westerners, kind of imbibe their attitudes and project it on the rest of China or on the Chinese leadership. And to an extent, this is even true of people in the party. You can meet party members, officials, especially at lower levels or younger generations, who say don't take Marxism seriously at all, even if, as I believe in written, the the leadership really does. And to just kind of come away, it's like, oh no, Chinese don't really believe that because your Chinese contacts there don't. That that's the first weakness is that we kind of have this tendency to replace our personal connections with maybe more professional analysis. That's an interesting analogy because, of course, during the Soviet Union, the former Soviet dissidents were the ones that Americans had the most contact with. In a way, we have the maybe the opposite problem or tendency that we did in the Cold War, where in the Cold War the only sources we get are either the Kremlinology top line official documents or their dissidents who are very much against the system that they're they're coming from, and led naturally to a, a hawkishness. I. Tend to think that for the last twenty years we've had the opposite problem that our sources and connections and ways of looking at it have led to us to maybe not take the issues that should be taken seriously as serious like the way they should be taken. And yeah, it's and this is one of those problems: the, the friend from Be- Beida problem. This attempt, this tendency to project our friendships with liberal Chinese onto the whole country. It is very apparent.、Yeah. It, there's an interesting personal aspect to it too, because say you're interested in China in 2010, like the amount of things you could be doing that are connected to China that don't involve sitting at home reading party documents all day, the opportunities are enormous. Versus if you're interested in the Soviet Union and or Russian culture or whatever, and it's 1970, like your only outlet is is Kremlinology, and from Kremlinology you get a much different sort of sense of the society than you would by. By living, by living a more normal life. Now that's exactly right, and, and it's right in more. It kind of goes to my second point. It's right in more ways. The second point I would say that the way that increasing access can sometimes cloud our vision, or at least give us an incomplete picture, has to do with the way China experts are trained today, and they're trained differently than they would have been in say the '50s or '60s, precisely because of the access they have. Most China hand experts tend to be social scientists, political scientists, especially. There's a fair number of economists and sociologists thrown in. And what these guys are trained to do normally in their home discipline is data wrangling, large data sets, regressions, and then sometimes formal models. But 
right now there are so many opportunities to take build some kind of a internet crawling thing and to make these massive data sets. Everything on Weibo or of all the different things the Ministry of this or that is doing based off of their little announcements and stuff and trying to make these big, large data sets that answer, I guess, empirical questions, right? That's what social science is about, is quantifying and then seeing if you can falsify things. But I think there's certain important questions you cannot answer this way. You will not be able to tell why the party is deciding to reduce Uyghur births in Xinjiang or what the party's intentions are towards Taiwan through a large end data set study. You find that out by looking at party documents and looking at the organization of the government and the party state and by trying to piece together the ideology that holds it together. And modern China watchers are not studied, or they're not, not trained how to do this. Historians are, but they don't really write until, like, they, they write up to Mao, sometimes now Deng, but they don't go past that. People who study modern China rarely learn this way of working, unless they're in maybe, like, working for the CIA or something, and they have to create briefs, but then the rest of the world never sees that. And so modern China people go to where there's low-hanging fruit, and in this world of immediate access, that's where the data is. And that's another way. I think how this opening up has, again, distorted isn't the right word, but emphasized certain aspects of China and its political system that yeah. give an incomplete picture if you aren't looking at the other stuff. And then the final way that increased access has maybe distorted our vision a little bit has to do with kind of the individuals involved. So take somebody like Kissinger. He you know, doesn't speak Chinese or anything like that, but he can call himself like a China expert. He writes books about China. He advises about China. His claim to insight comes from his deep connections to people of importance in the party state and in the kind of princeling communist establishment. That's where he gets information from. And that's and it's these connections is where he gets a lot of his money from through his consultancy. And so what that means is that the way he presents information, or let me put it this way. His access, his status as somebody who can say something important about China depends on his access to key individuals. These individuals would not give that access to somebody who they think is not treating them fairly. And so that means it's very hard for somebody in Kissinger's position, even if you take aside like the money question, which for Kissinger is like an issue, but just the broader question it's very hard for, say, him to come out of the bat and be maybe critical or point out the problems. Of course, he's going to be taking the line of the people whose position he's channeling. There's a large number of established China hands who have lost a lot of relevance in the last five or six years, but I think you fall in the same boat, where if you gain your relevance and your voice because of your access to the system, that means just like a, newspapers in America have the same problem, right? It's hard to question your sources. It's hard to push back if you know that you're going to get cut off access. It's the same issue. And in this case of these China people, the issue is even more difficult because a lot of these people were personally part of the project of bringing China out into the world, helping America and China come together, sure. help really, frankly, bringing about the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. They did this because they thought it would be good for the world. This is their legacy. And they didn't have bad intents in all this. They honestly thought they were doing what was good for both China and for America and for the world at large. And I think in 1999, you could make a very convincing argument that if you were one of these people who was helping liberalize China, and China was liberalizing at that time, and integrating it into the world system, that you were doing a good thing. I, I don't dispute that. But what that means is that if you were one of those people at that time, that's now your legacy. That's where partially where your authority comes from as well. And you have a great desire to defend that. You don't want to be thought of as, oh, I'm the person who's enabled the rise of a quasi-genocidal authoritarian state who may now control the rest of the 21st century. That is not what you want to be your legacy. And so you also have a very strong psychological reason to say, oh, this isn't, these documents don't really mean that they think there's inedible conflict between the, the socialist system and the capitalist system. That's not, that doesn't really mean that. They don't want it to mean that. And that's not something you had a problem with 
in the 1950s and 60s and 70s sure. when people were looking yeah, at the I Soviet mean, Union? Aside from working in an intelligence agency, there really isn't a business model that allows you, or, or for a long time, there was not a business model that sort of allowed you to pursue this sort of research and get and gain this expertise coming at it from a contrarian streak for the 2000s and, and much of the and much of the 2010s. But yeah, I, that, that's absolutely right. But it's not just the issue of, oh, all these people being paid off, though some of them were, but a lot of them weren't. But really, it comes down to, Okay, so take somebody like Michael Swain, who did this very famous study in the, I think around 2011, 2012, 2010, somewhere around then, when he more or less pulled like 60 important officials and experts in the Chinese system and then an equal number in the United States to see how Americans and Chinese thought about different issues differently. If you're in that position, if this is the kind of research you're doing, it depends on your ability to shelter and foster these connections and if you can't if you're seen as an enemy to the chinese state even if you're saying things that are uncomfortable truths the chinese if you're a journalist who does this you get kicked out of the country if you're a researcher who does this you don't get these interviews anymore and that provides a very strong incentive to not see those things where others who don't have these connections might be seeing them. And I think, honestly, there's a lot of talk in China world about how the like younger China hands versus older China hands have very different perspectives and the younger ones are more hawkish. I think this is partly why. The younger ones don't have the, the guanxi that they have to maintain. And then, of course, they grew up in a, they, they experienced China in a more authoritarian China. But this is a part of it. The sources they use are different. And if you rely on access to the system, you're always going to be a little bit more moderate because you need to keep that access up all right tanner after trashing everyone after trashing the prior generation let's hear your theory of the case so what is the theory of history that guides uh xi jinping (laughs) after trashing the prior generation oh my don't worry we'll we'll be old soon enough (laughs) (laughs) i mean I, i don't want to discount like even the pe- work done by those people isn't bad. It's just incomplete. And I feel like until really quite recently, there hasn't been enough work that has focused on more or less just reading the party documents and figuring out what they say. And maybe I should explain why this is important. Because I think Americans in particular kind of have a They look at something like a speech by Xi Jinping and say, this doesn't really matter. This is cheap talk. The political science phrase is that it's, I think they say cheap talk, but the idea is that it doesn't really, this is just rhetoric. Leaders all the time signal things through their speeches and then do something different. What what is going on here? And my answer to that is that the Communist Party of China has 90 million people in it. A little bit less, but about that. They have very if you're Xi Jinping you have a very difficult task you have a very clear idea of what you want the party state to be doing and even a fairly good idea of how you want them to go about doing it you've been many of the same positions that the people under you now are you've seen on the ground how it works right that's how you rise up the ranks and you need to find some way to get everybody on the same page and to get people to coordinate this huge, gigantic mess of a bureaucracy. One way that the party does this is through ideology. Ideology is not, in the China of the current moment, a lot of ideology is not meant for like popular consumption. Most of those speeches by Xi Jinping, they're boring. They're not meant to be read by normal people and to be inspired and to change their mind or make them feel like, oh, I'm so glad this guy is our president. Instead, they're just a party members. And the slogans and the catchphrases that they use are guideposts, instructions that are supposed to be used to help guide party members in what they do. And for example, in this recent piece that I wrote for Palladium about the theory of history that guides Xi Jinping, I start out by talking about the conference held in 2018 and 2014. It was the Central Work Conference on Foreign Affairs. And when that happened, they had every single ambassador from all across the world come back to Beijing 
they had all the main, the whole Poly Borough, they had all the main people in the United Front Work Department and the MSS in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs all come and listen and do workshops and then listen to Xi give a speech. In this environment, you're not just giving platitudes to people. If you're going to gather everybody together, it's because you're trying to teach them what you want them to do. You're trying to get them all to pull the same way. All those ambassadors all scattered all over the country, world. That's the purpose of a lot of these rhetoric, all these speeches. And when you look at something like the governance of China, which is the volume of speeches that Xi Jinping has had published in his name, those excerpts are specifically included and codified as the canon specifically because they are intended to help act as authoritative guides to action. The political work report, which was published in the, when the CPC had their last major conference, is the result of months of wrangling between different bureaucratic factions, and it comes out and it is the official line of what we're doing and why we're doing it and how you should try to do it. And of course, like every single individual is going to have trouble taking these kind of sometimes vague directives and putting them into their real day-to-day work life. But that's the purpose. And ignoring these documents, what they mean, how they connect together, seems to me to be extremely unwise. And there's a lot of social scientists in particular who will say, no, we should look at like formal models and see what China has done and compare these things. If I'm going to look at China's intentions for the future, I think the first place to go is to see, okay, what are they actually telling their people is the purpose of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how to do it. And that's what these documents are about. And it's not just, you know, the governments of China, there's other things like the party journal Qiushi is something I rely on a lot as well. But those are the kind of documents that I take very seriously. And a lot of my most famous writings have more or less been me reading 10, 20, 30, 40 of these things and pulling quotes from all of them to put together a coherent whole. How does one learn? I'm not sure, to be honest. Like, there's, it's not taught very often is the problem. I think there's a few public institutions where they teach analysts some of this stuff, but it's not taught very often in academic programs at all. I mostly learned about it just through watching other people who did it very well. People like, say, Dan Tobin or Nadege Rolin, Peter Mattis, and looking at their kind of work and being impressed with it and seeing how they cite their sources, the sources they go to, and then more or less deciding, okay, I can do that too. Alice Miller. There's a, there's a list of people who do it pretty well. And so it's just a really a matter of reading what they do and then trying to follow in their footsteps. Now, I'm not the most brilliant at it. I read Chinese quite slowly. I prefer to work in English editions first and then reference the Chinese whenever I have questions, when I can. And I, a lot of the time, I feel like my role has just been to take the research of other people who are smarter than myself and to condense it down into 2,500 word essays that normal people who have no understanding of China at all can understand and use. That's an unsatisfying answer to your question, but it's, it's the truthful one. Yeah. Okay, so Tanner, what is the theory of history that guides our, our beloved chairman? One way to start looking at this is to look at the constitution of the Communist Party of China. Like, they're very there on its very first page. It talks about how one of the reasons that it is in charge of China is because it is able to use the dialectical tools of Marxism to understand the laws of history. This is not a new idea. It's a very old Marxist idea that there are productive forces that create a certain structure and superstructure. And then if you understand these productive forces and the laws that govern them, you can understand the future course of world history. And a lot has been thrown out of the Communist Party's understanding of Marxism and its relevance to China today. But I find it interesting that when Xi Jinping had these study sessions with members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo last year, I think, or it might have been in early 2019, or late 2018, he emphasized this aspect of the Marxist tradition, that there are laws of history, that the trend of the times can be understood, isolated, and that this is one of the important legacies, both of Marxist theory for modern China, but also one of the reasons why the party needs to be in charge, because they're the people who can understand this. Whether or not there's actually a scientific process involved is something I think about a lot. I haven't seen a lot of evidence that there is. 
Because the party never presents it as in, oh, here's how we figured it out. They just tell us all, this is what we figured out. But it's really clear that Xi Jinping in particular believes that the history has a trajectory and that the job of a leader and a statesman is to understand this trajectory, to understand where the wave of history is going and to ride that wave instead of trying to swim against it. And in his speeches, he regularly identifies, I think, three forces of history, trends of the times, is what he calls them. In particular, he talks about how globalization and the economic integration of the different economies and the technological integration of the different economies of the world together is an unstoppable force of history. He on various occasions, has compared it to like the ocean. The ocean of globalization is there, he says, and trying to stop it is like trying to force the water of the ocean back into the rivers and lakes from where it came from. The next one is what he calls multipolarization, duojihua, or also the democratization of international affairs, this idea that you're moving from a unipolar system led by the Americans to this inevitable distribution of power among many different power centers across the globe. And Hopefully, he says, the change in global governance structures, which will also make it less Western and America focused and more distributed. And then his final one is he thinks that uh, peace is the trend of the times, that in this current historical environment, those who try to use military force to impose their will on other countries, it will backfire on them. See Iraq. And that the way forward, the, way, the, the trend of the times is towards economic development. And that this, the interest in economic development, are much more powerful than things that lead to conflict. Especially in places where it's actually happening. And where it's not happening is where you have conflict. And so this is his assessment. His, uh, the communist documents will often talk about how he has a clear-eyed assessment of the course of world history. That the world is going towards these three things. And so the Chinese grand strategy sure. has to be in accordance with these trends instead of fighting against them. So here's the harder question, Tanner. Is he right? That's hard to say. What I think is interesting about them is how similar they are actually to what a lot of Westerners were saying oh, about 2000 to 2005 or so. If you like an very interesting book to read is Thomas P.M. Barnett's The Pentagon's New Roadmap. I think it was published in 2004. It was based off of a set of slides that this individual, former Naval War College professor and consultant, gave to almost every four star in American service between 2003 and 2005. And it's more or less like the blueprint for the grand strategy the Bush administration adopted after 2003, the invasion of Iraq. And in this book, Barnett divides the world into two parts, the core and the gaps. And the core is the, the part that's economically interconnected, where development interests are all shared. The West, Japan, China. And then the gaps are places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Northern Africa, who are not benefiting from these things. And the job of America, he says, is to more or less go into those places. That's what the purpose of being in Iraq is for, is to go into these places and integrate them, help them be part of the core. So that they'll enter this stream of history that is inevitably leading to globalization yeah. and the, we thought, liberalization of the whole world. And now Xi Jinping rejects the military intervention part, but it sounds similar, doesn't it? So weird, yeah. Well, and this is the thing, though, is the Americans discovered that it, it, history didn't quite work out the way they thought it did. What, nowadays, people make fun of end of history talk. Nowadays, people make fun of this idea that globalization is the inevitable result of history and that things must go the way they are going. And I wonder if the Chinese won't have their own moment. For us, a lot of that moment was 2008. For them, who knows what it will be? It might be Taiwan. Now, they never said, the way they've promised many times that they won't be aggressive hegemons, that they're not going to go and try to export their system through force, they're not going to be a military power in Africa, that kind of stuff like that. They've said those things many times. They never make that promise about Taiwan. They've always held the option to basically invade it through military force. And a lot of the military buildup in this time of peace and development is precisely about the Taiwan invasion. But they said, they said the same idea. They gave the same rhetoric and they proposed the same idea for the Taiwanese people. Hey, Let's make our development 
and your development the same thing. Let's tie our economies together so closely that you won't need or want to be independent from us. They were very frank when they said this stuff. And it hasn't worked out for them, has it? The Taiwanese are as anti-China as they've ever been, and they've soundly rejected this bargain. And so one wonders if that might not also happen in other parts of the world. We made it! A hundred episodes of China Talk! That is two and a half full work weeks of informed, respectful, and hopefully entertaining conversation on everything China. As the media industry has cratered, spaces for intelligent and open discussion on China that live outside of paywalls basically don't exist anymore. Since COVID has locked me out of China and forced a move to the U.S., my living expenses have gone up, and spending dozens of hours on this podcast is looking increasingly unsustainable. All in, right now I make less than $5 an hour producing this show. If you'd like to see China Talk continue coming out weekly, please consider supporting me at glow.fm slash chinatalk. I'm also thinking about launching some member awards like live Zoom tapings of episodes where audience members can ask questions, as well as a China Talk book club. Thanks so much. So let's take on uh, Taiwan then. So what do you think would precipitate an invasion? And what's your latest on how you think it might play out militarily? I wrote an article for Foreign Policy a few years ago titled, Taiwan Can Win a War with China. A lot of it was based off of research in a book by Ian Easton called The Taiwan Invasion Threat. And he did most of his research 2014, 2015 like. It was based on a few other things too, but that was the main source. I spent the last year in Taiwan, a lot of it on military reporting, and I've changed my assessment. And I think actually Ian Easton has too. I now question whether or not the Taiwanese by themselves would be able to resist. There are certain things in their favor. Geography, huge thing in their favor. There's only certain months of the year that you can mount an invasion force because of hurricane risk, typhoon risk. There's only a few beaches you can go to. I've been to about half of them in person, took pictures. And those beaches have been like, they grow spiky plants all over them. They put all these defense things on them. And apparently in time of war, it'd be even worse. The invasion of Taiwan would be the largest military amphibious invasion in human history. It'd be an enormous operation. They wouldn't be able to hide it. We would know weeks beforehand, months perhaps. And technology favors the defender. The same thing that makes the United States really nervous about sending its ships close to Chinese shores is a problem for any potential Chinese invasion force coming across the strait. Those are the advantages the Taiwanese have. But they have some very fundamental disadvantages. And it has to do almost with the... Maybe you should tell me again that story you were telling us before the, the show started, because it's exactly what I'm talking about. So you have this friend from sure. Taiwan, and what does he say? I don't, I, I don't know if I should in trouble or anything whatever but, but let's give it it's like people suffice to say people actively avoid service and the ethos is not the sort of thing you find in israel where people feel like they're constantly threatened and that uh, the country needs and deserves them that they that the military really really needs their 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 full commitment I, I, fundamentally there's a lack of willingness to make sacrifices for the sake of national defense and there's a lot of reasons for this. Like we could spend a whole show just talking about like why it's like this. How come they're not like Israel or Poland, which or Estonia, where every single citizen is taking classes on how to repel an invasion, and the morale is fierce. Taiwan's not like that. Taiwan is extremely defeatist. The Taiwanese people are extremely defeatist. They don't necessarily believe they can win. The training of conscripts is very poor. Reservists on paper are not real extreme problems in that regard and the military the political leadership hasn't had the courage to ask the taiwanese people to change it essentially if you're going to this is what i believe very firmly the Ty taiwan is supremely defendable if they want to they can save themselves but they have to be willing to do real national service not four month fake stuff where they don't even really learn how to shoot a gun um, and, and, as, and as background for this, is part of the article that I'm writing, you know, you'll see I've interviewed dozens and dozens of people who just got done with their, their conscript training when I was in Taiwan. And it's sad. They'll, like, you meet some of these guys who really wanted to learn how to be a tough soldier and how to, 
use a gun and defend the country. And they come out feeling like their national service period was a complete waste of time. They didn't learn how to do anything except how to do gardening work. And that's a huge morale drain. The Taiwanese could be preparing to run an insurgency or something of that sort, which would make a very tough dilemma for the Chinese. At number one, you have to have the, you have to be able to get across the strait, not lose your fleet. Then you have to be able to fight on the beaches. And then even if you do that, you have to fight off this insurgency for years and years or months and months while engage in a, like a high intensity conflict with the Americans and maybe the Japanese at the same time. That's a very different strategic gamble. And Taiwan's safety depends on them being able to more or less convince the Chinese that gamble is too risky for any Chinese leader to face. And the Taiwanese population, while very patriotic, has thus far proven unwilling to make basic sacrifices in terms of conscription, in terms of raising taxes, in terms of daily life inconveniences that come from turning your country into something of a garrison state. This is easy for me to say, right? I'm not Taiwanese. I'm an American. It's really easy for me to say, oh, you should do that. You should do this. It's not my country. And that's a fair critique. But I don't know if there's a way forward for them if they're not willing to make very fundamental changes. They have so many things going for them. It's possible. It's not like Hong Kong. They can do it. But they need to be able to do it and not just hope the Americans will come in and save them because I don't think that will be enough. And I don't know how willing the American people will be to have their own people dying for the sake of Taiwanese who are not going the full measure themselves. Sure. You write in one of your pieces, Tanner, the tools have never changed. The only thing that has changed is the party's assessment of who is an enemy and who is part of the people. Care to, care to expand? I believe I wrote that piece shortly after reading The Tragedy of Liberation, which is a history of the party state in the 1950s, after they took over. And in that piece, in that book, they talk about what the party did to seize control of Chinese society after they had seized control of the country. It was a deceitful thing, in a way. The party had promised something like inter-party democracy, a coalition of people. They had promised the businessmen that we are not going to uh, molest you, take away your stuff. Not yet, not for some time in the run up or in the civil war when they were trying to get support. And they got support from a large percentage of the Chinese population. And this kind of worked, like how, how could the communists do that? How could they make these promises to the capitalists? Mao Zedong has a, a speech where he talks about this. And he says, basically there's friends and there's enemies and who's a friend and who's an enemy is not stable. We have an enemy at one time. And in order to fight that enemy, we will make the friends we need to make and we will co-opt them. And then once that enemy is defeated, we'll have to reassess who is and who is not part of this, this, who is with us and who is not with us, who is sufficiently committed and who's not sufficiently committed. And you can almost view it as like friends are managed by United Front Work and enemies are managed by the army and then the security services in a sense, in very broad term thinking sense. And what happened in the 50s was the capitalists, these other parties, along with lots of other groups, intellectuals, religions, foreigners, criminal organizations, prostitutes, all kinds of different people, were switched from being friend to enemy. And the tools that were used to control them were very successful in kind of more or less destroying them, taking them down and making them subservient to the party. The party has never disowned this aspect of its history. There's the famous phrase about how Mao Zedong did 70% and 30% wrong, historical judgment. And when people like Xi Jinping or other party members high up talk about the history of the pre-Dung times, they say that late in Mao Zedong's life, there were leftist errors. And they're talking about the Cultural Revolution. They're talking about the Great Leap Forward. This period that came before, they do not regret and I argue they take a lot of the same tools and use them today to control who they perceive to be the friends and enemies of their cause. So now business people are back to being friends and the United Front manages business relations inside China. The, people, the, National, People's, the National 
political consultative conference has many prominent entrepreneurs on it. They're friends. Uyghurs are enemies. And the methods which are used to, say, control the Uyghur are, in many respects, very reminiscent of what we see in the 1950s. Like, I can pull up really quick here. This is quoting from some interviews that were done in 2017 from a Human Rights Watch report, where they're talking about how they had to go to struggle sessions. Quoting, people had to read out their speeches. They call it speak up and show your sword. I had to too. It was different people every time. I wrote some bullshit. China has been developing rapidly. That no other country has managed to do what we do in modern history. That we have to thank the party for our prosperity. That we have to fight the three evil forces. Another quote. There was a wife denouncing her husband, an Ayman who was in prison for extremism, saying something about him propagating Wahhabism. And then a kid who denounces his father for having prayed and read the Quran. There were also people who exceeded their birth quotas. The couple and the kids were crying as the authorities announced the huge fines against them. This was called looking back. Wait, ho can exercise. Looking back at what bad things people had done in the past 20 years. This kind of event where you're gathering all the people in the village to pick yeah, out the people who've done sins else. and what they're going. This is like textbook what they did in the 50s. And yeah, they're, they're, it's essentially the same tools. The same the tools of how you co-opt people to be on your side or how you coerce the people who aren't. The party has never disavowed these tools and they still use them today. It's just they have a different definition of who needs to be hit with them. Thankfully, if you're Chinese, like a far smaller percentage of the Chinese population as a whole is an enemy than was the case in, say, the 1950s. But the tools themselves are still around and the conception behind them is also still there. I don't really think there's a big difference between the way that the party treats college students abroad and business people now and the way it was treating them in the pre-liberation pre period and the way they're treating the Uyghurs and then other groups say like Christians that are not part of the official getup uh, is very similar to how they dealt with these exact same issues in the 1950s. The main difference is we don't have a national land reform campaign at this point. It's not necessary anymore. So in, a, in another piece, Tanner, you, if there was one theme that threads its way through the great sweep of Chinese tradition, it is a tragic recognition that the world we live in is not designed to reward the life that is most worth living. I want to write a book on this theme at some time. I have it in my head. I call it like the tragedy of the Chinese tradition, something like that. But the basic idea behind this point that I'm making is that if you find any serious Chinese thinker, be they a philosopher, a poet, a novelist, or even many of the statesmen, any humanist from the time of Confucius to the time of Lu Xun, they have to deal with a question. They all deal with it in some way, shape, or form. It's not, it might not be the only thing they deal with, but they all will deal with this question. And that is essentially, how do you justify a good life when doing good in your life is bad for your life? Or another way of saying that is, why do all the bad things happen to good people? And should we still be good people if it means bad things will happen to us? And there's this kind of recognition that in Chinese history, a lot of the time you do good things and the bad things happen most of the time. Now, this, this idea isn't completely unique to the Chinese, right? Seneca wrote an essay about it. Christians have long pondered this problem. But I'm fascinated with the extent to which the Chinese kind of obsess over it. And you see it all over the place. You see it starting with, um, you can even find some documents from the Zhou time that kind of touch on it. But Confucius is a really interesting example of this, where he is this, the world's best philosopher, the man who can save kingdoms, but he ends up doing nothing with his life. And that puts Confucians continually having to think about how, how does that make sense? How does it make sense that our paragon of virtue is a man who lived life mostly in comparative disgrace and what does that mean for us you have people like and, and, and this argument plays its way through the philosophers of the early period where you have the Taoists who more or less say just give up don't worry about this problem right the way to lose this problem is to just not care you have people like the Han Feizi who more or less say, no, the right answer to this is to embrace the fact that you have to do bad. You have people 
going forward in history, you have people like Tao Qian, the poet, whose answer to this is, well, you need to preserve your virtue from corruption by more or less becoming a hermit, leaving the world of politics behind and going and becoming a, a poet who writes about his gardening and things like that. And you have poets like Li Bai, who more or less recognize the problem and say the answer is just to enjoy life and to imbibe yourself in wine. And that is enough. And you have poets like Du Fu, who look at the same problem and say, well, that's not enough. We have this sense of responsibility and we must take on the suffering and see the world as it really is. Even if it means we end up kind of white haired with our little kids in poverty. You have lots of Confucians who write about how you more or less need to come forward and get your head cut off when you're going to the Ming Emperor and telling him all the wrong things he's doing. You yeah. have, this is in the novels too. I, I, like, so the Sanguo Yan Yi, the, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, is essentially, this is one of the essential themes of it, is that the people who are like Zhuge Liang and Liu Bei, the good people, have multiple chances where they could have won by doing the wrong thing. And instead, they were good enough to do it, but they lose. And they lose because they make the decision to do what they consider the moral thing. And they end up losing the whole empire. And why, why do that? You can and look they, at and these guys are heroes. They are heroes. Although there's different... Op like, so again, if you were to look at something like the Outlaws of the Marsh, though, it's the opposite thing. Where these guys, it, the heroes of that novel are a series of men who... Some of them are at fault legitimately, but a lot of them are more or less blamed by an unjust, incorrupt system for things that they shouldn't have done or are goaded into doing or the other people did instead of them. And they become outcasts. And their solution is that you reject the entire world of, and the entire hierarchy of the Confucian system and instead find a new set of values in the kind of egalitarian brotherhood in the marshes. Yeah. This is a rejection of the traditional Confucian world. You can look at something like uh, Ruling Weisher, which is this wonderful satire of Confucian life at its whole. It was written in the Qing Dynasty. I think it's been translated into English as The Scholars. Scholars, by, yeah, yeah, yeah. By Gladys Super Young. funny. And it's another example of this, the same problem, this recognition that the people who are succeeding in life are not the people who are doing it, but the people who are manipulating the system. You can look at something like Cao Shui Qin and the dream of the red chamber and it looks at this problem especially in relation to women and even Lu Xun, right he starts his career with diary of a madman and kong yi ji these two short stories which are about basically how the confucian system has gone wrong and diary of the madman is really explicit this idea that the madman is actually the sane one but everyone considers him mad because of his inability to do the evil things that his society expects of him. And this, and this is just a few examples. I've just said like some of the most famous ones all throughout Chinese history. And you can follow this thread, this question of how do you manage a world where doing the right thing, what you think is the right thing, does not bring about material social rewards? How do you manage that distinction? Do you choose defeat? Do you embrace defeat? Do you try to negotiate between the two? You just say, no, we just choose the rewards and we forget about all that being good stuff. It's a kind of fascinating topic. And I think the Chinese treat this question with a lot more seriousness and subtlety than most works in the Western tradition do. We, we talked a fair bit about Chinese fiction and that and, and philosophy and that answer. But I want to talk about for a minute the book that I found to be the best entry point into imperial history, which is something that you recommended, uh, F.W. Moat's Imperial China, 900 to 1800. So what's so, special, what's so special for you about this book? That's amazing. Everything about this book is amazing. Uh, if I get 20 books on a deserted island, this is one of them. What I especially appreciate about this book is Moat has this really unique ability to have a, the, the eye of a humanist over vast periods of time he's somehow able to like reconcile there's a lot of like big history books that take away the individual and just look at things from the angle of large scale stru structures and economic exchange institutions how they change over the long durée. and his book is that but his book is also an evaluation of individual emperors individual famous figures philosophers thinkers 
artists in Chinese life, and he's able to catch the moral tenor of the times and make very almost old-fashioned judgments. Old-fashioned being like, it's not in style for historians. Like Plutarchian, to... yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, the way that Sima Tian or Plutarch or Thucydides would have done. There's, um, this, is the ba- this is a bad dude. He didn't live up to his age. Um, that's right. Or, this guy really is a real standout. Mostly men. But, but they're all fair. What are you gonna do? Oh, he has a few women, but that's right. Mostly men. There, were, there weren't any women emperors at that time. The only one was in the Tang Dynasty. And so he, he, does, he is really fair. He's able to capture the kind of larger dynamics of each era, how politics or economics or things worked, and then also integrate in this very humanist vision of what history is and do it in one book for a thousand years. And it's a gigantic book. But his ability to do that is amazing. I have a little bit of criticism of how he treats the Mongols. I disagree with that. But everything else, I just think this is the best treatment of almost any comparable rank of time written by any historian. I, I, I know very few. And I think it's a real shame that he never wrote like the first version of this, which would be from the Han through to the Tang, in the first thousand years of, of Chinese history. I wish that had also been written, but we don't have, we don't really have that. It makes me sad. Yeah, I just remember, I didn't know anything about the Jurchens or any of the, any of whoever was pissing off the Song. And the, the, and the sources aren't like super abundant them compared to the other dynasties but like with the empathy with which he's able to to give all those northern empires who you tend to you tend to only get a few paragraphs on even in the other general histories of china i felt really i was incredibly impressed by i'm really pissed off because i'm like it's like a thousand pages i'm like 700 in and i did not take it on my vacation to malaysia which i was was supposed to be a week in january and i haven't been able to finish it now it's on a boat and maybe I'll get to it and, uh, in, in October or God knows when it comes over here. I totally agree with you, like the way he treats the Liao and their empire. Like he does a really, really good job. But in general, such an excellent work. And it's just like the world's largest shame that you don't have the same treatment for what I think is the most interesting period of Chinese history. The Han and the Tang are my two favorite dynasties. I think they're the the interesting ones. And the Tibetanian is pretty interesting too. And it's just a complete shame to me because there is no proper treatment of the An Lushan Rebellion and all the great human drama that has been made into 5,000 Chinese soap operas. There's nothing like that in, in English history. So I'm sad that Moat never tried to do that as well. But you can't get everything... I feel grateful what he did. So Tanner, one of uh, my favorite blog posts of yours is this thing you wrote five years ago now, doing like a clarion call for more people to study the Chinese strategic tradition and write these sorts of books and fill in these gaps of knowledge that that happens in English language literature uh, with regards to Chinese military Mm -hmm. and political history. So how have we been doing since then? We've been doing pretty good since then. So I'll, I'll just clarify what that post was. I wrote a two-part post, which tried to be like a bibliographic essay that summarized almost everything we knew about the Chinese strategic tradition that was published in English. Um, I didn't get quite everything, but I got a lot. One half was focused on practice, like military and diplomatic history. And the second half was focused on like the thought, the ideas behind it. Since that was published in 2015, 2014, one of those two years, there's been a lot, actually, that's been done. And I think we've seen the most movement in three areas. And those three areas are in kind of normal military history. The second one is in translation of primary sources of of Chinese intellectual thought. And then the last one is in contemporary studies of the PRCs strategic thinking documents that matter that kind of stuff the first one the military history we've seen a lot of movement there one historian swope he calls it the golden age of chinese military history i think that's a large exaggeration it's only golden in comparison to what came before and what came before was an extreme dearth of political military diplomatic histories of the grand course of Chinese history. There's very few. The main reason being that sinology started out as an outgrowth of philosophy and philology, religious studies. And so a lot of people who study these ancient Chinese things just didn't care about narrative history. 
about political and military events. And you could only really discover these things by reading their works and like reading the sections they wrote about the political context for the things they really want to talk about, which is the representation of Guan Yin in 5th century China or something like that. In the past five years, though, there has been a creation of the Chinese Military History Society, which has its own journal, the Journal of Chinese Military History. And that produces, I think, two volumes a year, an excellent article length writing on it. And from those people who are doing it, it is 10 people, really, and their graduate students, we've had a steady stream of campaign history. So in the last, 10, like the last six years, we've seen histories of the Song Wars of Unification, the Song Mongol Wars, the Mingqing Transition, the Injin War. You've had histories of the Taiping Rebellion, of the Opium War, of the White Lotus Rebellion. You've had several books now written on aspects of China's participation in World War II, several campaigns of the Civil War, and one for the, the Chinese war against Vietnam in the late 70s. That is all great. It's really great to have all that. But there's still huge gaps. I, I mentioned the An Lushan Rebellion a little bit earlier, right? One of the most significant storied wars in Chinese history. There is no history of this book, political or military. The uh, do, Three do, Kingdoms? Do two sentences. Sorry. Do add like the two sentences on what the An Lushan Rebellion is. And then okay. just, just say that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the An Lushan Rebellion was this like gigantic rebellion in the Tang Dynasty that kind of ripped the Tang Dynasty apart. And it's famous for like the Shakespearean characters involved, for the king, his consort, who is blamed for the war, for the An Lushan, the Songdian general who starts the rebellion himself. In like Chinese literature, these are these, these giant figures that appear in Chinese poetry and plays. And I all, every time I read about it, I just think, oh man, why would Shakespeare have done with these characters, right? These people deserve their own Shakespeare play. And we don't even have a real history of it. You mostly can learn about it by reading commentaries on Tang Dynasty poems. So sad. Or another example is of the Three Kingdoms Wars. This is easily the most famous war, series of wars, in the history of Asia. In Korea and Japan as well. Everybody knows the minute details and characters of these wars, partially because it was fictionalized and now there's books and video games and comic books. A very famous book called Romance of the Three Kingdoms. But like an actual historical account of what happened, there is a $200 biography of one of the major figures. There's a few studies of representations in poetry and in media or more, but you don't have an actual account of this is what happened, despite it being easily the most famous and like storied war in all of Asian history for everybody involved. The only thing that even compares yeah. is World it's War II. Just, it's just crazy to think that like every every month of 700 years of British history has its own book and its own like scholarship and its own debate. And we can't get one book about, we can't get more than three books about the Taiping Rebellion, which happened 150 years ago and tens of millions of people died and like completely reshaped the future of China. The last few years have actually seen like a small explosion of writing about it. And what used to be five books is now 15 books. But compare that to what's been written about Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and right it's, front, yeah. There's like some of the largest battles of the war don't even have the Ishigo operation. A huge battle. No, nothing's been written about it. Not just there's a chapter that's been written about it in one of those collected volumes. But there isn't a full battle history, and it's sad. Uh, the Three Kingdoms War is the one that gets me the most because it's just so like in Chinese. There's literally hundreds of books about it. In English, we don't even have one complete attempt and you know part of this like has to do with again I, you know, I mentioned earlier in this podcast about how the way that social scientists training priorities produces the work they end up producing and how that work isn't as useful for the larger world as we think there's something very similar going on here but with sinologists i had a conversation once with a a historian of the song dynasty and i said to him how about, would you ever consider just doing like a narrative political history of the first 200 years, the Northern Song Dynasty? And he says to me, why would I do that? Um, the the Sima Guang's Zizhi Tongzian exists. 
That's the comprehensive mirror in government. This, <laughs> this 60 volume work in classical Chinese. And I'm like, what do you mean? There's <laughs> Bro, most people, like two people in North America have, have, have digested that. In whole. Exactly. There's like, you would be doing an immense <laughs> public service by taking the, basically taking the Zizhi Tongjian and reducing it to 200 pages or 300 pages of English narrative. That's 200 years of human history. That What's so important about spending the time and effort to familiarize yourself with these gaps in history? I, I feel like there's two maybe answers to that question. And one of them is something that a group of political scientists, I'd especially associate with Dave Kong, have focused on themselves, which is that a lot of our understanding of what we think of as universal principles of, say, human history, great power politics, and so forth, come from a very narrow slice of humanity. They come from basically Europe in the last 400 years, and then maybe the rest of the world in the last 40, 60 years. But we have these huge sections of humanity that are also human and are also doing politics and literature and all the great subjects of history are part of their history. And in the Chinese case, the records are so good. They're better than many of the European ones for the last thousand years or so that we can, they, they really should be part of that story. And then if you have a history that's just informed by one small section of humanity, the political scientists will say, oh, everyone thinks that it's natural for there to be balancing between different states. But if you look in East Asia, it's actually, that's never been the case. They, they haven't had a perpetual system of balancing for the last thousand years. That's a very narrow political science international relations point. But you can bring this, the same idea to a much broader range of topics. And if you don't understand one fifth of humanity, their historical experience, especially when their history is a lot more accessible than, say, all the people who lived in Africa and didn't have written records for that same period of time, it's really a shame. We're limiting ourselves and our knowledge. And then, in a more personal way, I found looking at Chinese literature and elements of the Chinese tradition, be it philosophy, even political theories and statesmanship. To be personally meaningful, I'm very interested in the, I mentioned this tragedy in the Chinese tradition concept, this, this idea that there's a trade-off between being a good person and being successful and that you ultimately must, must choose is not unique to China. There's a very similar sentiment, I think, in, say, a lot of the Christian tradition where it talks about how you must be of the world, in the world, but not of the world. And for somebody who maybe I, I'm in a conservative in America who's on the like who, who's not really with the, the the Trump zeitgeist and who very much rejects the current progressive one, I find a lot of personal meaning in these Chinese thinkers who understood the, the cost of putting your values before your personal position in a way that in a, in a lot of the West has not really been explored in, in as beautiful or as interesting of terms. And, and so that's one of the reasons why I find personal value in that. And I think there's lots of things like that, where you have a civilization that goes back 2,000 years, where people have been thinking through deep problems. And to cut yourself off from that wisdom when it's available to you, I think is very sad. So the three favorite classes I had in college were seminars where each semester was like 20 years of ancient Greek history. And we would read every snippet of every, every source you could find going from the, the pottery to the four historians who were still writing about this, who were writing about this stuff, whose uh, text we have today. And the case that you can make for the Peloponnesian War still being relevant in 2020 is on the one hand, you can say, oh, it's this universal thing. And through uh, humans don't change, like Thucydides says, we're just, we're just all you know, running on the same running on the same models but there's also the argument that people in the west have been reading Thucydides for 2000 years so what he's written has shaped the way people think and act and interpret the politics around them and if you buy those two lines of thinking at all all the more reason to delve into the the Chinese thinkers and historians who have tried to work over the same sorts of questions for just the sort of reasons that you laid out
Well, well, that's exactly right. And, you know, on one hand, you have the the relevance of many of these thinkers, works of literature, and historical events or personages, figures, in the modern East Asia, because all the rest of Asia usually reads and has as their historical kind of cultural touch points stuff from Imperial China or ancient China. And I absolutely think it's necessary, especially for understanding just modern Chinese discourse. You got to understand what it means when they compare somebody to Zhuge Liang or whomever. And But I also think more important for a lot of Americans, because not every American cares so much about the intricacies of modern Chinese political discourse or cultural allusions in their favorite sea drama. But I think all Americans care about what it means to live a good life or how politics really works. And there's real wisdom in a lot of the Chinese tradition that we should pay attention to if we do care about those things. So Tanner... Chinese and Mormons, riff away. Uh, here's what I can say about that. So I am Mormon. I've, I've gone to LDS churches in China. When I was a missionary in America, I, I taught a few Chinese, although my mission language was actually Cambodian. I worked mostly in a, a Cambodian refugee community in Massachusetts at that time. Church's position in China is interesting. They are not one of the religious institutions in China. There's only four of those, and they're not one of them. But they have some kind of deal with the Chinese government to more or less have their ability to operate in the country not be affected as long as they don't proselytize. So when I was in China, I basically made an agreement that I would never, ever talk about my faith with somebody who was not already a part of it. And then likewise, foreigners and Chinese Mormons are not allowed to um, worship together at the same time same rooms. So people, I I might not drink tea, which is very common in China. And people would ask me why. And I'd say, oh, because my religion. And then they ask, why does your religion have that rule? And I would reply back, I'm sorry, your government told me I can't answer that. (laughs) I would love that if you ever leave China, I'd love to tell you all about it. And I would say that all the time. But that kind of discipline, I think, Mormons are are a little bit unique and be able to, because it's very hierarchical, it has a strong, very hierarchy in, in the church. And they're able to enforce those rules on ourselves. Like, we don't talk about these things. This is, we all realize that this is what allows both us and the Chinese Mormons to peacefully practice their faith, even if they can't talk about it, share it. So there's no missionaries in China. Almost all the members in China who joined, joined outside the country. The hundreds are baptized every year, or at least they were up until this pandemic. There's Chinese speaking Mormon missionaries in Scotland and Paris, Japan, Australia, 10 or 12 different locations, United States. In many cases, they are like when I was in Massachusetts, I was a missionary leader. And some of the missionaries who reported to me, the ones who were doing best above anyone else were the missionaries over Cambridge and the university wards. And I would look over the records and talk to them. And I figured out pretty soon that the best, like this pair of missionaries was producing more converts than anyone else. And who were all their converts? It was all Chinese students studying somewhere in Cambridge, Boston area, studying abroad. There's a fantastic interest among Chinese who come to the West, especially America and religion, in a way that I did not see when I lived in Taiwan or in places like Japan, where there's a lot of cynicism towards religion. It's a very new thing, but the religion as a whole is a very taboo topic in China, or it's a topic that a lot of people have had no exposure to. And then they meet through their classes, some Mormon who's actually very devout yet smart. And they assume that this was an impossible combination before. And then they become extremely interested. Like it's just fascinating to them. And then they start to participate and they end up joining the church. I have many personal friends who more or less followed this exactly. And so, yeah, the Chinese government allows them to come back and practice their faith. It even allows people from China to go outside of China and serve as missionaries. I have several close friends who did just that. But inside China, they're very, they live in very narrow lines. And this isn't without precedent. The Mormon, the LDS church just announced that they'll be building a temple in Shanghai, which I didn't think was possible. I didn't think the, in this age where everything is getting more harsh, and more and more life is being controlled by the party. I thought it would be impossible for the church to open up a temple in Shanghai, but they did. 
And it's not without precedent. In Eastern Germany, in the Cold War, the LDS Church was able to more or less make the same arrangement. And that happened because there's a, a meeting I once read about where Thomas Monson, who was then a Mormon apostle and would later become the president of the entire church, met with a communist party official in East Germany. And they said, we have listened to every single speech you've ever given here in this country. We have bugged half of your <laughs> informal talks. We've listened to, we, we visited your churches. We know that you are not trying to be a destabilizing force in this country. We trust you. And so we will allow you to build a temple and to have your people leave as missionaries. And so they did it again. They more or less followed the same playbook in China. And they are arguably one of the Western institutions with the, in a strange way, the best relationship with the, the Communist Party government. And they've mostly done that, though, by being very clear that they are not going to make any waves whatsoever. And in a way that the communists appreciate, the Mormon church has very strong control over their members. When they commit, our people will do this, their people will do that. Do you think there's, aside from the control factor, are there doctrinal things? Do the Chinese look at Utah and see, oh, that'd be a decent way for for the, the CCP to develop one day? Is, is there anything deeper than uh, them trying to stay out of the way that you think has made the faith not too scary for the, the powers that be? Uh, I don't know if there's anything explicit in the Mormon doctrines. And in fact, the doctrines really should go the other way where this is a very strong civil society type actor and it's led by a prophet who people who are part of the church believe is a prophet. That's, that's exactly the kind of thing they, they tend not to like. But I, I think the church has over the last several decades done a lot to build up a relationship. The current president of the church is a former heart surgeon and he had traveled to China several times, learned enough Chinese to be basically conversant with them. In doing these medical exchanges early on when China was opening up, the church has been sending service missionaries to China for a decade or two. People usually tend to be older couples who are past retirement, who are doing things like helping whales and modernization and that kind of stuff. And they've seen that good faith effort on the church's part to just help the Chinese people. And I think they take them that they believe them when church leaders say that we only have good things intended for the Chinese people and that people who join our church will not be causing trouble. They'll just be adding to your society, acting more morally. And in an age of Xi Jinping, when party officials aren't supposed to be out there drinking with everybody anyways, that's the new rules that we, we cut down on the parties and the prostitutes then uh, maybe it's a little, actually a little bit more easier. It's a little easier for LDS people to get along in the Chinese system than it might have been even 10 or 15 years ago. They've benefited from that new culture. That's funny. It, it works both ways, right? Like on the one hand, yeah, you don't have to cozy up by going to banquets, but also the straight, the straight and narrow lifestyle is now something that is getting... There was what was a new thing last week where you can't like over order food at a restaurant anymore. So this sort of lifestyle add ons, maybe not, I don't think tea drinking is going to go anywhere anytime soon in China. But, but that works pretty well. The, the LDS faith is very into simple living and almost Puritan in many of its ways of thinking about things. And so that, I mean, obviously, I, I, I don't know anyone who's both a active party official and a part of the church. I, I think that's crossing a bridge too far. But if these people are working in business and they have to deal with the party, well, then it's easier than maybe some other actors who might be trying to get these folks previously they either to break the rules or who are really hurting in this new world. They, they, it's easier for them to adapt to it. And I know several Chinese who feel very grateful that um, she has basically cracked down on this culture, which before was, was very hostile to them and very hard for other Chinese to understand why they weren't willing to go out there and have fun with the prostitutes and drink 40 cups of Baijiu after the business meeting. That's fascinating. So Tanner, how do you try to improve your writing? I don't have a good answer to that. Just by writing and reading what other people write, my I'm often frustrated with how slowly I write good things. I feel like I can write lots of pretty phrases, but I wish I could write them faster. 
If you know any secrets on how to be a more productive and effective writer, feel free to tell me. So my cousin works at OpenAI and she came over for dinner and let me play with GPT-3. I had a column I was writing and like the, my like concluding sentence I didn't really like. And I just deleted it and threw it in and told GPT-3 to write a concluding sentence. And it wrote like a better sentence than the one that was in my head. And I was blown away. <laughs> um, I, it was, and then I made it do it a few other times at like other places where I thought the sentences were a little weak. And it just was incredible. I really think just that the thing when you're writing and you basically know what you want to say and you get stuck or distracted and go look at Twitter or something because your brain is like a little annoyed that it has to do like this like writing -y task, mm -hmm. the AI is just going to be able to do that part, which will, which will just make, make writing like a lot more pleasurable because like the, the, like the, the thinking you'll still have to do, but like the workman like part of like making sure like the claws, the clauses line up or whatever. It's going to be a tool and it's going to be a really awesome, fun tool for writers who already know what they're doing. Yeah. Because it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to, it, it will become a little more like curation and it'll just speed up the process. And I'm really excited. Okay. Thanks for having me on China Talk. Thank you so much. Uh. 你还在重复无能为力的抱怨时我们代表华工精神就算到达游戏啊 因为太火了，像是天生带货的，下到就Burning Burning